And their friends, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And Huck is in the house. She's doing good. Oh, she loves those scratches on her head. Oh, Dad, please give me more. Yeah, it's a good girl. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, Huck's demanding more time off. The similar, the, the normal route, more money, more time off. Lazy girl. So. <laughs> she just gave me a... <laughs> All right. Starters, people are gonna ask about the hat. Get the hat at our store. Hat means a lot to me, a lot to me, a lot. Front of the hat, Liberty. The design on the hat was painted by my bus buddy, Harvey Pratt, who did the Smithsonian's Native American War Memorial. And it's an eagle. Then my son lined himself with eagles, bald eagles specifically. That's why Ben's initials are on the side of the hat. And no, the flag is not backwards. When you wear, put a flag on a hat, that's the way it's supposed to be for our military. Now you can get the book, Missing 411 Washington, right now on our website at NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. And this story, well, it's a tough one, folks. The story is about Washington's, and it isn't in the book because we just found it within the last week. It's a huge story, huge. And it involves three young boys. I've never told this story before. I never have known about it, but it, it fits to a T exactly with what's going on in Washington. I've stated it before and I'll state it again. The Washington coast seems to be a hunting ground for young men and boys. Zero, zero, nada, girls at all. All young men and boys along the coast. The story involves a young man, several young men named, one named Keith Kumanick, Mitch Zimney, and Tony Burns, 16, 17, and 17 years old. They were missing January 25th, 1986. Hey, hey, let's not do that. Be a good girl. They were juniors at Anacortes High School in Washington on Fidalgo Island. And all of these young men had commercial fishing experience in Alaska previous summers. They knew the ocean like you know your backyard. They're very comfortable in it. They go out all the time. The three boys knew a man named Glenn Ford. And Glenn had an 11 foot skiff with a seven and, a horse, seven and a half horsepower engine, two oars, six gallons of fuel and life jackets. And he, the boys asked if they could borrow it to go fishing. He said, sure. They said they'd be gone about an hour and they were gonna leave at a place called Alexander Beach on Fidalgo Island, drive across Burroughs Bay and go to Young Island. I want to make sure I get this right for you. This is where the boys lived. Seattle would be way down here. This is uh, San Juan Islands out in this area. This is the city they lived. They went just across this little little location right here. Started at the at the, the beach, and they just went. They were going to go a mile across the bay to the island. Do some fishing and come back. Quick trip, no big deal. Easy peasy. They left in good weather, no problems. Glenn said, hey, these boys knew a boat better than I did. He said, me allowing them to use my boat, I didn't give it a second thought because they were so attuned to it and the ocean. 
Well, late that night, on January 25th, a Skagit County Sheriff gets a report of three boys missing. They go out, they meet with the parents, and now it's raining and the weather and the ocean is rough. So Skagit County gets a hold of the Coast Guard, gets a hold of a private group of search and rescue, and they say, okay, we're gonna set up search and rescue the next morning, check all of the land on the islands and on the coast, and then we'll put a couple of Coast Guard helos and a couple of Coast Guard ships out looking for the boys if they're still on the water. So January 26th, they put it out. Here are the boys. Keith was the youngest. Tony and Mitch. The next day on the 26th, the weather was perfect. And they stated it several times, perfect. Flat seas, big sunny weather, the perfect day to be on the water. And if there was anything floating, they'd, they'd see it for miles. U.S. Coast Guard sent up two helicopters, put out two ships, and the Coast Guard from Canada also participated. And they had several volunteers covering the beaches. And there's a couple things here. First of all, these boys knew how to swim really well. That wasn't the question. They had life preservers with them. And the thing is going to get more confusing as we go on, and you'll see. January 27th was another perfect day for searching. Two helicopters went up again. They're not finding anything. And they should have found life preservers, number one. Number two, they should have found the oars right away. They float. Didn't find those right away. And they had fishing poles and some other things in the boat that should have floated, but they weren't. They didn't find any of this stuff. Now they're three days into it, January 28th. An oar was found on the beach on the south side of Burroughs Island. It was positively ID'd by Mr. Ford. Search and rescue sent dozens of searchers into that area and several boats looking for the life jackets, fishing poles, and clo clothing. They didn't find anything. Again, the boys were starting here, taking the boat across this little bay, one mile ride to the island. Now, right next to the island is this island, a bigger island, and that's where they found the ore on the south side of this larger island. Now, they were going to go fishing around this smaller island. That would be called Young Island. And then they'd be back. Now the time frame that they were going to be back would have meant that they were traveling in all good weather. January 30th. The mother. The mother of Keith Humanick. spoke to the press. I want you to listen to this statement closely. It's strange not to find any part of the boat because it was fiberglass with a foam core. It was designed to stay afloat even if the boat broke up. Keith's older brother Jeff stated it was a very sturdy boat. Okay, now, now it gets even more confusing. And I'll tell you why. So there's a part in my life where I lived in Santa Cruz, California, right on the coast. And it was a nine year wait to get a boat slip there. Hey, I'll admit it, I love fishing. And I lived there for 12 years in Santa Cruz. Well, about my fifth year there, I said, hey, I want a boat slip because I, I, I love fishing. I'm gonna get a boat, we'll go fishing. Well, the Pacific Ocean and Monterey Bay can get real rough. So I looked into all different kinds of boats. And I decided that if I got that boat slip, I was gonna get a boat with a foam core. Because the reason 
you fall in the ocean, on the Pacific Ocean, you're not going to live long. Temperatures range between 48 and 56 degrees. You're going to you're going to die soon. You're just not going to last long unless you can get your body out of that water. Now these boats with foam cores, I did I did deep research into them. First of all, very 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 rarely do they ever break up. But when they do, they break up in huge pieces and they stay afloat forever. So when the humanix describes this, I'm thinking, "Oh my gosh, this makes no sense at all. And the stories I read on other sites were complete lies. They said, oh, it was a real fragile uh, uh, aluminum boat. It would have, would have sank right away. No, not according to the articles I read. Not even close to the truth. Well, the Coast Guard continued to search 1,500 square miles, southwest to the Puget Island, west of Victoria, BC, they were covering a huge area. Everybody agreed that the current could be strong coming through that area that the boys were at, but nobody, nobody gave it an ounce of thought because of the experience these kids had on a boat and in the ocean. January 31st was the last day of the search and rescue. No wreckage was seen on the water. They had helicopters flying at between 1,000 and 5,000 feet looking for anything floating on the water. No debris, no gas, no oil. Remember, they had a six gallons of gas in a spare oil can. That didn't even show up. Life vests didn't show up. Fishing poles, the boat, the three boys, all gone. The boys were extremely well versed on ocean travel. Now, I gotta tell you something. When I heard this story, it just like light bulbs went off inside my head. And here's why. That whole area of Washington the coast, something I've looked at for years. And the last time I was in Washington, I spoke about this at length. Now again, this story is not in the Washington book, but all the stories I'm gonna to talk to you about in the next couple minutes are. And they're on the Washington map in the book. Yeah, uh, three foot by two foot map that comes with the book, all nice folded up. It's a driving map of the state of Washington. So here's a map I just made up. This is the coastal area. This is where the boys disappeared, right here. Right up here, this is Bellingham. This is two other young men disappeared. This is Vancouver Island. Up here is Tofino, young boy disappeared. Two young men disappeared, and a boy disappeared. Another boy disappeared. Two boys disappeared at the same time in Port Angeles. Also, in Victoria, just outside of Victoria, another young man disappeared. All of these young men and boys, folks. No women, no girls. The only thing that comes close to this in all of my research is Pennsylvania. Now, the other oddity about this, I guess I could talk about it. So, this is the U.S.-Canadian border right here. And Vancouver, British Columbia is right up here. Vancouver has the notoriety of being a place where dozens of feet have washed up to shore. Now, my team and I did a big dive on this. And we searched all over the world. Maybe one foot here, one foot there. But never has there been the massive amount of feet that have been found washed up on shore as in that greater Vancouver, BC area. 
Nobody's really explained it well. I can't explain it. It's a, it's a highly unusual anomaly to that area. So, that's the disappearance of Keith Humanick, Mitch Zimney, and Tony Barnes. God rest their soul, wherever they are. But there's a backstory to this that to me is just as disconcerting as those missing boys. So the boys disappeared. On January 6th, the Anacortes High School had a memorial service for the boys. Kind of a healing. Tried to heal. It was way back in 86. But that city had suffered some huge losses. And this just capped it off. I don't know if I could live in a city that I'm going to tell you all the losses they have incurred. History of the families. Tony Burns' father, Ron, was a captain of a ship called Altair. It was out of Anacortes, and the boat was on by another Anacortes resident named Jeff Hendricks. Mitch Zimney's brother, Ron, was a skipper of Altair's sister ship called Americas, also owned by Jeff Hendricks. Now, Americas was built in 78, and Altair was built in 1980. Both were essentially mirror images of another, about 125 feet long. This is a picture of Americas. They were crab boats. Now, Americas was built in 78 and went right out to the fishing grounds in Alaska and fished every year. Altair, built in 80, had three years of experience when it went out every year fishing. Again, mirror images of one another had several, several years of experience in rough water of Alaska. Very rough water in Alaska. And both were mainly crab boats, but both had been modified to carry and to fish for other things in these tough times that they were facing. Now here's a story that I still can't get over. February 14th, 1983, 0 2.30, 2.30 a.m. Altair, departed Dutch Harbor, Alaska for crab, grushing, crab fishing grounds off Pribilof Islands. So I'm a big fan of Deadliest Catch. Probably because I'm a big fan of Mike Rowe, the narrator. But watching these fishermen, <laughs> I thought about it. I thought, well, not seriously thought about it, tr trust me. I'm not man enough to do their job because they, they stay up 21, 22, 24 hours a day, a couple days straight. I couldn't do it. I could not do it. I need my sleep. These guys are manly. And they work in absolutely freezing cold weather. So Altair departs Dutch Harbor at 2.30 in the morning. Nothing unusual about that. Six hours later, their sister ship, and, and they're like, they go together everywhere. Americas departs Dutch Harbor on the identical path and on an identical mission as Altair. Um, here's where it gets strange, at 3.10 p.m. So about seven hours after Americas departs Dutch Harbor, a ship named the Neptune Jade reported an overturned ship 25 miles northwest of Dutch Harbor. Not that far. Coast Guard flew a helicopter out over it, confirmed overturned ship, couldn't identify it, uh, looked for life rafts, anything, not, nobody in the water, no life rafts. Coast Guard said they needed a dive rescue crew on site. 
to get in under the hull to see if there's anybody trapped there. Coast Guard dive rescue crew departed Dutch Harbor at early in the morning on February 15th. And as they were flying out, it was the boat was identified as the Americas, the one that left at 8.30 in the morning. And seven hours later, it was overturned. Attempts to, that were made to reach the Altair, the sister ship. They were calling for it, say, because they wanted it to go check on its on the Americas. Altair wasn't answering its radio. So they, just, they asked other crab boats in the area to start looking for the Altair. Then they sent multiple helicopters from the Coast Guard out and they sent a cutter out. Well, the Americas sank in 4,000 feet of water before the dive rescue crew could arrive. Americas, there was no rescue call, there was no distress call, and the search went on for the Altair until February 20th. Nothing. They found nothing. Usually you find life rafts, you find people in the water that are deceased in their cold water suits, nothing. Nothing for a month, March 16th, 1983. An unoccupied life raft of the Altair is found 11 miles from where the America's hull was first found overturned. Got to understand this, folks. Two, two fish, fishing vessels disappear within six hours of each other on the same route, going to the same place with no distress call. Coast Guard reported that. Each of those vessels were in 13 foot waves, bad weather. So what? So what? I mean, it happens every, every winter in Alaska in the Bering Sea. The ships are meant for horrific weather and they had survived horrific weather before in the years prior to them fishing up there in the Bering Sea. Coast Guard reported that there were seven men on each vessel. All of the men, all 14, from the same city as the three boys. Unbelievable. None were ever found. Each vessel, the Coast Guard stated, was worth $3 million. Each vessel was equipped with an EPIRB, an emergency locator device that's activated by touching the water. No activation was made. There were many articles about this saying that it reminded people of the Devil's Triangle, the Bermuda Triangle, etc. Coast Guard stated that the boats probably capsized and sunk quickly because they had crab pots loaded improperly on each ship or they were overloaded with crab pots. Now, I know a little bit about this just from watching Deadliest Catch. So, a boat, this being the Americas, when you start to load a boat with crab pots and you load it real high, the center of gravity of the boat changes. 
crab pots are crab pots are real heavy. So a lot of times on Deadliest Catch, you hear about the captains just dumping crop, crab pots off the side as quick as they can in real rough water, trying to make their ship more maneuverable and safe in that rough water. Now trust me about something. <laughs> I don't know if the Coast Guard was right or wrong. But I will tell you this. I think it's enormously odd that both ships disappeared within six hours of each other. I'm just saying. Now, if you're a longtime follower of my work, you know I've stated that it's important where you come from. Yeah, I still think it is. If not, I think it's even more important now. I've told you about people, two physical therapists that disappeared in Alaska that ended up growing up near each other in Pennsylvania. They never knew each other, but they, they grew up together very close. So now you have 17 men, all from the same city in Washington all disappeared with nobody watching, nobody seeing what happened, not one body found, all gone. How could you not think that is odd? When I was thinking about, when I was going through this, I was kind of stunned that somebody hadn't done a documentary about this city and about the loss that it's incurred and about the families that have been destroyed. And I mean, to lose one brother or a father on one fishing sh boat and then years later to lose a young son fishing on a small boat again. That's just too weird. I'm sorry. And it probably would, I wouldn't make such a big deal about it, except this map. I'm sorry, friends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, excluding the 14 men. So here's 12 young men right here that have disappeared, excluding the 14 on the fishing boat in Alaska. Is it all related? I ask you consistently, you believe in coincidences? Do you? I know several people that I talk to on a regular basis said, Dave, no such thing as a coincidence. Somehow, and our feeble mind probably doesn't understand it, it's all related. Now, lastly, I told a story about three young men who disappeared in Lake Erie on this channel. You should watch it. Very similar. Very similar to this story. In an area where there were a lot of young men that went missing. All around that lake. These guys were never found either. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Huck's behind you. Out for the count. Remember, get the hat. It'd be a perfect hat for the summer coming up. Lightweight, nice. I've already worn it in the rain, shed the rain real easy. It's a cotton hat, and it is not made in China. Be safe, love your family, do something kind. This is the Kindness Resolution. Thank you. Politis out.